It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Tuesday, May 2nd, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that is excited to dig into the Phantom season today. Yeah, let's see what, what was good, what was bad. Yeah, we're going to get into that with Sam Wismer all on today's show. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here with Russ Cohen, who is on Twitter at Sportsology. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. You can subscribe or follow Locked On Flyers for free on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts to get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, today is all phantoms all the time. We talked to Sam Wismer of Flyers Nitty Gritty and... Uh, she has been covering the Phantoms in depth all season long and has some really interesting insights uh, about the team. We had an excellent conversation with her, and we are bringing that to you right now. All right. So we are, once again, thrilled to welcome Sam Wismer of Flyers Nitty Gritty and the American Buttes AHL podcast to talk all things Lehigh Valley Phantoms. She has been knee deep in Phantoms coverage all season long and is really one of the foremost experts on that team. So we're so happy to have her here. Welcome, Sam. Thank you for having me. Anytime. So just big picture, like what's your take on how to manage the Phantoms from a balancing prospect development and creating a winning culture? I think you, you got to balance these kids, I think, delicately just because of the state of the organization. Um, I think the prospects that they, they brought up at the end of the season were a good idea of who you could possibly see on next year's roster. I mean, Tyson Forrester is going to be a given. He doesn't need to see the, the lights of the AHL anymore. Um, yeah, I think he's 100% ready. Um, Ronnie Adderd, however... <sighs> Defensemen are so hard to, to gauge. Um, do I think he's ready? I think he need, he's going to be back and forth next season. Um, but just to kind of balance, you you got to touch it delicately right now because you're rebuilding. And I know a lot of people don't like that word. but so With Adder, just so the listeners know, is it still like the pace of the play? That's probably his biggest Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, Jenning could have a good chance. Um, I mean, Emil Andre, I mean, he didn't get to see anything up there yet, but he could possibly be there, but, uh, you know, balancing the development, you got to do it delicately or it's, it's not going to go the way that you plan. Yeah, I agree with that. So getting to the balancing act part, Sam Urson. So when he was up with the Flyers, he played like a lot of games in a short period and then when he was back down with the Phantoms, he played a lot of games in a short period. And my my feeling with that was, you know, you do have a goalie coach in the organization. I don't know if it always extends down to Lehigh, but it just seemed like they were just playing Urson because he gave him the best chance to win and they didn't really have a schedule at the end and they just played him too much and he got tired. What, what do you think happened with him? Exactly what you said. He got burnt out. He got ran into the ground. And so did that surprise you that that happened or? And I don't want to, I don't want to say anything bad about Lappy because I have a good relationship with him, but you don't start your goalie after he played 99 minutes the night before in a two OT game. Yeah. I think that was to me a, a mistake in decision-making uh, when we've, talked about Sam Erson on the show 
we've said that, at least I've said, I won't speak for us, but <laughs> I've said that I think that's what makes Sam Erson like such a good 1B compliment to Carter Hart is that Carter Hart tends to uh, be a guy that has to play a few fewer games than a top goaltender in the NHL generally. And Sam Erson can handle the volume, but at in a 1B slot won't get overused like that. Yeah, and he was being definitely overused in Lehigh just because of the goalie situation that we had going on with Grossnick being out and uh, Mayer being brought up from the ECHL. Uh, it, but let me let me ask you this. Like, I like Mayer, and I think there's a future for him, but you still have Pat Nagel, and it seemed like they didn't want to play Pat Nagel, and I'm wondering, like, why? He's a good AHL goalie. Um. He, he is a good AHL goalie. I just feel like every time he was in net, they lost. But it wasn't his fault, technically. Okay. Um, defense left him out a lot of the time to dry. And, you know, I see him play here in Reading, and it's a night and day difference. They don't leave him out to dry. It's... I, I can't even explain it. Like he'd go to Lehigh there. He'd have losses. He comes here and he's, he's like literally people want to kiss the ground. He walks on here. So again, he is the second all time winning goaltender in the ECHL. So. Yeah. So that's right. fair. I mean, look, Jonathan quick played in the ECHL too. So exactly. Uh, didn't Grubauer as well. Yeah. Yep. So talking about that defense in front of the goaltending here, you know, one of the things that Russ and I have talked about is the defensive pairings in Lehigh and how that sets up guys for potential NHL roles. And you want to pair kind of a veteran defenseman with a prospect sometimes, or you want to see a prospect pairing together like that. How do you think the Phantoms manage that in terms of managing the defensemen? and then being able to give them the right kind of minutes to get the experience they need, but also win, right? Um, yeah, Lappy actually did that really well this season. Um, you know, going back to Ronnie Adderd, he was paired, I believe, with Connaughton a couple times. So yeah. you have you have uh, the experience of Kevin Connaughton, um, and he kind of helped mold Ronnie. And then at one point, the line was literally ginning at her, ginning at her, like for months. I can't even right. like that, that pairing. It's love it. Yeah. That's a good pairing. But what would bother me is, is that at some point I think Adder should have been tested on the top pairing because if you really want him to be a second, third pairing guy in the NHL, he should see top pairing time in the AHL. And it's like, they weren't going to move Belpedio and Belpedio is not your future. No, Belpedio is here on like a one year deal. So he's done unless they decide to resign him. Um, I mean, so but then you find that that was kind of odd. Like that. that yeah. Was the, okay. Yeah. It was, I mean, Ronnie was on the first line a couple times of what I can remember, but you gotta again. We go back to the balancing act. You got you gotta have veteran presence on the team, especially when you have so many young prospects. They gotta mm -hmm. learn somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was also interesting the dynamic shift when Cam York moved up to the Flyers uh, and stayed there permanently, and then like it felt like Zamula was in this no man's land for a while and wasn't able to develop properly because there wasn't a good pairing for him and the usage just was a little off, but I want your take on that. When it comes to Z, uh, that's what we call him in Lehigh, we call him Z. Uh, he actually has had an injury since September, um, but it kind of, it was one of those injuries where it gets better, it comes back, it gets better, it comes back. So I think that had a lot to do with his play this year. I mean, he was obviously in Philly, so he wasn't hurting too bad, but then he came back to Lehigh. He got shut down for the rest of the season and he had surgery, I believe, on April 10th. Right. So, I mean, I think that had a lot to do with him this year. But you notice when he's not on the ice. I can say that. Not just because of his size, but because of his play. It, it it was definitely noticeable, and you you missed him during playoffs. I think that would have made a, a little bit of a difference. 
I think so too. We'll have more with Sam coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite event should not be stressful. So Game Time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all the fun you will have. My favorite part of the Game Time app is that it's great for getting notified about those last minute tickets and flash deals. Plus, they have views from your seats. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Also, the tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you'll never have to dig through your email to find them. So snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem with the code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So let's have some straight talk about uh, Bobby Brink. Like I always say, people's expectations should never matter where a player was picked or the circumstances. But unfortunately, the the team because they you know he was in involved with the passing up of Cole Caulfield and then you know taken after York, the expectations are probably higher than they should be uh, with Brink even after coming off the surgery he did. So. He, you know, he came back. I felt like he was okay. I felt like, yeah, his skating still needs work, and I don't, I'm don't, i not moving off of that. But I also felt like his play away from the puck can be better. And, you know, he didn't really light it up in the playoffs. So I'm curious, you know, where you think Bobby Brink's at at the moment. He needs one full year in the AHL. Exactly what I said about Tyson Forrester. Tyson needed one full year in the AHL. Yeah. Um, Brain came back from surgery. He lit it up for a month, and then he dropped off severely. He holds onto his stick way too tight. Um, he tends to overthink a lot during plays. Um, it just he he needs to work on that. Uh, and his skating, I mean, definitely needs to be worked on. I think people put way too much pressure on prospects, or you know, they hear these names like Emil Andre, and I'm getting like. 10,000 questions yeah, yeah, yeah. at his first game. Right. I, wanted to, I wanted to shut down my Twitter. I'm like, just everybody <laughs> shut up. Yeah. Um, but you can't have such high expectations. You got to yeah, keep it out. so minimum. soon. Like, it's, it, you can be excited, but don't have such high expectations because when they come up to the Flyers and they don't produce the way that you thought they were going to produce, what, what, what are you going to say? You're you're right. you're gonna bad mouth them, but then I'm gonna go back into my tweets from a year ago saying, "Oh, you were excited about this one, though, right?" Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think with Bobby Brink, um, you know, your point is a real good one. Where he needs to build some different muscle memory in terms of what his in- instincts are. I think he just was so kind of locked into what he was used to doing. And he just has to build and add more tools to what he can do and think about, you know, more options out there to be able to work better with line mates that he hasn't played with in college for those years. And, you know, like just be able to have the flexibility to be able to make different decisions sometimes. And he was practicing since November with the Phantoms and he didn't come back until January. So you know, getting, getting to know all that, um, just watching him play like that first month was, I never really watched him before. So like, I didn't really truly know a lot about Bobby Brink. I will sit there and admit that, but I think it's going to, he needs a full year. Well, and, that's I fair. I mean, and I know everyone's. Some fans like, don't want to hear it, but, but that's, you know, they need to, they need to hear I, it. I know everyone's really excited to see him play. Get AHL TV and you can watch them play. <laughs> there you go. I like that. That's a good plug there for the AHL. So keeping with the um, the vein of talking about some of the prospects, you, you mentioned Emil Andre, right? So 
I wasn't worried about him coming over and really adjusting to North America. What the adjustment is for him is he's got to come over and adjust to North America, being a smaller player in a tight checking game. Like that's what he has to do. Now, the thing is for me, and again, I don't know how they're going to handle him for me next year. He's got to be running the top power play and run that for the whole season because uh, I look at the NHL and I know Andre's, you know, always had power play time wherever he's played, always usually been the top guy. But you look at the NHL and you say, all right, well, Provorov can certainly play the top power play, but, you know, his shot's not great, but at least it's somewhat accurate. Cam York is great passing, but his shot is horrible right now. His shooting percentage was awful. Like, it just needs so much work. But then you look at a guy like Andre, and you know that his shot is super accurate. And so I look at Andre and say, whether he's a one or a two for them in the future on the power play, I need to see a lot of them on the power play and then get him the right partner and and then leave him, like you said, for a year. Yeah, if, if he gets those two things, he's he's golden. Otherwise, he's your typical Swede. Apparently, the, as the Flyers, we, we love our Swedish boys, so he needs the right partner. Yeah. Don't yeah, I... I... Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I do think some more time on the Phantoms will will do him a, a load of good. And um, especially, like, to Russ's point, you know, getting him that top power play time, I think, is especially important. I, yeah, he he needs time on the Phantoms. And I know people don't want to hear that because of his play. But you've got to remember, he only played how many games with the Phantoms? Yeah. This is what I was saying about Airson. I don't feel comfortable putting Sam Airson in a one A position. Say if we were if we were going to trade Carter Hart by any means, I would not put Sam Airson in a one A position just because of the small sample size he has. I agree. I'm with you on that. And this organization would be stupid to trade Carter Hart. Sure. I mean, I agree with that too. We have to admit, though, that the coach certainly at this point likes Sam Erson better than Felix Sandstrom. I think that's pretty obvious. I do not think Sandstrom will be here next year. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. think so either. And it's not his fault. He's a good goalie. It's, again, defense leaves you out to dry. It's not the goalie show. And that's what I have to tell people. <laughs> so not to, you know, get... Uh, wistful about things, but I want to talk a little bit about Isaac Ratcliffe in the context of development. And because I think it's important because he had a really, I think, strong season last year where he progressed and it looked like maybe he could like really make a play at, at getting to the Flyers. And then this past year, it was just like things just went south for him and eventually was traded um, and was playing in Milwaukee where he's been pretty successful. Uh, and like, what is your take on what happened there with his development? Um, since I'm there, like I'm usually at development camp and then I training camp. Cause you know, we don't get a break. Um, his training camp was awful. Downright awful. Um, and then he comes to the Phantoms and it was just, again, awful playing. I, I, I like Isaac as a person. But yeah, we all do. He's a great kid. Yeah. But just, it was awful. Um, I think the change of scenery was needed. Okay. And I'm glad he's having the success he is in Milwaukee. For an organizational standpoint, though, to let him go for nothing, do you think that was bad? I Not thought it was bad. the brightest idea. Yeah, see, that's where I had a problem with it. It wasn't so much that he was gone. It was just that he was gone for nothing. And that's why that's why Nashville jumped on him. That it was an and, easy, uh, easy decision for them. Yeah. Future considerations is a, a locker room cancer, too. So from what I Yeah, know. oh yeah. Now we don't <laughs> we listen, you'll never see anything for Brendan Lemieux. Forget it. Nothing's ever coming back. Flyers fans know this. Nothing yeah. is ever coming back for that. Future considerations literally means a steak dinner. That is mm -hmm. all it means. <laughs> Actually, I, I'll tell you what I do think it means. I think it means more than a steak dinner at this point. I think it means that maybe Chuck will get some sort of position with the Kings down the line because he did him a favor. That's a different 
talk for a different time. I know. Yeah. That's just my feeling. So in terms of coaching for the Phantoms, um, I, I would say that Ian LaPerrier made some significant progress as a coach between year one and year two. Um, I don't think he's there yet, but I think that he definitely learned a lot from year one going into year two. Definitely still made some mistakes, but uh, what's your take on him as a head coach at the AHL level? So I have a really good relationship with Lappy. I saw him last night at the Royals game where he was sitting there watching. He was also watching the Toronto uh, Toronto game there. So, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Can't help himself. Um, yeah. But he was there. Uh, Shell Samuelson was there. There were, it was literally like Lehigh invaded running. Um, mm -hmm. But I saw Lappy and I said, you know, I, I just wanted to be able to say goodbye to you because you know season ended. Um, and he got up, he gave me a hug and everything. So like we have a decent relationship. Um, year one, I think he realized he was trying to be too much of a friend in the locker room and you can't be. Um, so that kind of changed where they started winning games in like December of, of his first season. Yeah, and I was then, tough on him year one. I was very tough on him. Yeah. And then this year was like night and day. They were winning games. Um, he definitely made some mistakes, but I think that's all part of learning how to be a head coach. You got to, you got to, in the AHL, you have to be able to think on your feet as a coach. No, that's fair. Let me ask you this. Um, had there been a presence of a GM there in Lehigh for the last two years. Do you think that would have helped Lappy and given him more support? Cause you know, look, John Tortorella barely communicates with him. So he is kind of on his own. I know Danny was there a few times, but Danny was also in an interim position. So he probably wasn't going to be able to help him that much, but I just felt like Lappy also because Lehigh was sorely ignored uh, that not having that true GM there, I think really hurt him. What, what's your feeling? Yeah, I mean, I can honestly say that Danny Breer was there a lot, even when Chuck was in office, I guess. Yeah. Um, even when Chuck was in office, Danny was there. If the Flyers didn't have a game that night, Danny was in Allentown. Um, so Danny definitely does have a big presence in this organization already. I've seen him at Reading. Um, so straight straight down the line, he is involved. Um, I think think Lappy having a GM in Lehigh would have helped him tremendously. Yeah. Because he's trying to manage everything on his own. And right. I mean, it's a lot to, to yeah. do. I mean, you have your assist, you have your assistant coaches, Riley Armstrong and Jason Smith, but they can't make any decisions. Right. <laughs> right. In terms of prioritization of personnel and all of that. Yeah. And like, oh, well, the Flyers are calling for this guy. Lappy doesn't have a say of who goes up. No. It's literally John Tortorella is calling you saying, I want Tyson Forrester. Uh, 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 okay. Which I got to say was the worst timing possible to bring Tyson up. Yeah. yeah. We, we, oh, about we talked about stuff. that. You, and I, I'm going to go off on a tangent here and then I'll shut up. You can't tell me that you 100% support the AHL and you wanted to get these guys to play off. And then you pull up our best players. Yep. I did in, I did in a losing give, season for the Flyers. In a losing season where the games didn't count. I did give John Tortorella a side eye walking to the press conference after one game. <laughs> we'll have the conclusion to our conversation with Sam Wismer on the Lehigh Valley Phantoms coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by AG1 by Athletic Greens. Keeping up with proper nutrition is really hard. You're busy, you're stuck at your desk, you're eating whatever you can just to get through your day. But what if you could start your day with the ultimate daily nutritional insurance? With a single scoop of AG1 and a glass of water, you can do just that and absorb 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day right. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. It cost him $100 a day, which is unsustainable. He created Athletic Greens after experiencing how difficult it was to create an optimal nutrition routine on your own, all for around $3 a day. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. 
To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So let me let me ask you this, though. So also based on what I said before, where John's even admitted he doesn't have that much contact with, with Lappy and doesn't ask the Phantoms to play the same system as he, as he, um, most teams do. Most teams do play the same system as the parent club. <clears throat> and so I do wonder, do you find it odd that, and it's, and I think this makes it harder for Lappy too, that he isn't asked to play the same way as John, but just to, he's kind of left to his own devices. We we asked Lappy this at training or training camp or maybe it was like one of the first games in Lehigh. Um, you know, do you communicate with Torts? You know, what kind of system? And he literally said that Torts told him to do his own thing. Yeah, I think that's hard. I think again, this guy is a second year coach, and going into his second year, didn't have a great first year. That to me is not great footing for your young coach. You don't have a full time GM. You're left to your own devices as far as what your system is, and that's fine. But, like, for me, it's like I want a player, when they do get called up, especially on defense, defense is the hardest thing, to seamlessly be able to just walk right in and and play in Philly. And you can see a lot of times it wasn't. A lot of times the Flyers played 11-7 when a Lehigh guy came up because it's kind of like, whoa, whoa, we can't just have him walk in and play a pairing here. You know, we got to just – you know, so it's just it's a weird dynamic and it should be and it shouldn't be that way. No, I 100 percent agree. Um, I think it's also kind of a culture shock when you go from one system to the next yes. and you don't know what to expect. Um, yeah. Because yeah. Tyson Forrester, um, obviously, I was a fan before I was media. So I have a lot of friends who have, still have season seats and they kind of know where to stand when the players come out to, to leave the game and everything. Um and one of my friends asked Tyson Forrester, hey, is, is Torts as scary as he seems? And Tyson looked at him. He goes, dude, he's effing terrifying. <laughs> well, for a young player, it, it, you know, people don't realize it is because, and this is something that we've talked about on this show, at Rachel and I, is that it's the communication part is hard. Like when regular NHL players don't get communicated all the time, they kind of know their place in the league. Maybe they don't need it. That's fine. A guy like Forster, I think you should be communicating with him every day, more than once a day, so that player can feel more comfortable in what he's doing because naturally, as good as even that kid is, he's going to go up there and still feel a little inferior until he starts doing something. Yeah, 100%. Um, I was just very happy to be there for his first NHL goal. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah, that was I, think, a fun I, think, I think including you, Ross, I think it was you – Jim, Colin, and and um, Regina, and you all looked at me, and I was like, oh, oh! <laughs> and then I started crying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. It was great. That was a good day. Yeah. So was, uh, uh, I was proud of him. <laughs> I want to have a chance to talk uh, a little bit about the Reading Royals, who are in the Kelly Club playoffs in the ECHL. Yep. Just like what makes them compelling for Flyers fans and like where are they in the playoffs right now? So right now they just advanced to round two last night um, against they uh, were up against Maine Mariners, which um, Maine Mariners, fantastic team. They are part of the Boston system um, where Danny then, Breer was the uh, first executive is. position. He still is. He still is. Um, yeah. Yep, he still is. So he was there last weekend, and I think he felt kind of torn. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yes, he is still in the executive position for Maine. Um, uh, so, like I said, Maine, great team. Um, better better team one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, but, yeah, so Reading advanced to round two. They are either going to be paired up against Newfoundland or Adirondack. Um, I think it's going to be Newfoundland because they've just been on a tear all season long and um, that's the Leafs that's the Leafs organization right yeah that's that's Toronto yeah. Yeah. um yeah so they're gonna do three games at home and then 
for basically travel slash money purposes, they have to go up to New Finland because New Finland's a remote location. Um, yeah. What makes them so compelling is just at one, they have way too many AHL contracts down here, players that should be in the AHL. You have Colin Felix, you have Charlie Gerard, you have Jacob Gosher. Like it just, it's so this team is just so good and they they got hot at the right time okay let's talk about one of the forgotten lost flyers in mason i know Nolan. where you're going with this <laughs> yeah well because there's a good reason um i saw mason millman in person playing yes in the, in the ohl i spoke to cole perfetti who was a teammate of his and he loves them like he loved playing with them and I saw a jump in Millman's game in the OHL late in the season, right? Before the pandemic, before everything shut down. If you're going to give me the argument that their defense is so good in Lehigh that Mason Millman can't possibly crack it, my answer to you would be then you didn't need to sign Belpedio. Millman proved himself in Reading last year. They went into the playoffs. He did great. And now this year was kind of just like hung out to dry. How's he doing in Reading? And do you feel like, yeah, he should be a phantom at this point? A hill I am going to die on until I die, basically, is Coach James Henry, who is a first year head coach here in Reading. Um, he's 31, super young, but obviously he's doing a hell of a job. Um, has saved Ma Mason's career. Mason has made such a significant improvement. And that's okay. coming from someone. That's coming from someone who would be like, "Oh, Mason Millman's on the first line. Uh, why?" <laughs> no, but that's what he used to play in in the OHL. Like that's exactly what he used to do, and used to be a top power play guy. So, do you feel like? And and this is something that's not usual, because a lot of times guys get sent to the AHL and don't usually get that much better. Sometimes they're just there because it's you know. They don't have room in, in the AHL, and they're spending their time there. But you're telling me he's significantly improving. So then my answer to that is, one thing is it's great that they have a coach like that in the ECHL because not everybody does. But B, is that a little bit of a failing of the Flyers system that it took him to go to the ECHL to actually get that, get that jump? I don't think they believed enough in Mason Millman, and that's why they went out and they got Belpedio. Right. That's definitely what I see. Yeah. That's fair. And and do you see it being a similar situation with Zade Wisdom? Zade's a different story. Zade lost his game after his surgery. Um okay. he is slowly getting it back. I I've I've seen it here. He's he's a little bit of a scrapper. He was uh definitely trying to instigate some fights last night and I was like, Yeah, Zade, go. <laughs> um great kid though. He had the shoulder good. surgery, right? And then he and then he went back and he played in Kingston with Shane Wright. But I remember his scoring was not great, even there. No. Um, he's doing better here. I think he has maybe three or four goals. Don't quote me. Okay. Um, he definitely is more of a playmaker, so he assists in a lot more of the goals. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he's definitely getting better being here he needed to be here lappy wasn't giving him any minutes if I no we we complained about that on this show actually we did but here he, zade's playing 15 to 18 minutes a night that's good so okay. he's 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 slowly improving well, that is very good to hear. Uh, such good information. Yeah, we appreciate it, honestly. No thank problem. you so much. Always love digging into the phantoms and the future mm -hmm. of the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, where can people find you out there? So I'm on Twitter at Samantha Wismer. Um, you can also follow my podcast account at AHL Buttes. Um, I'm also on Instagram. You can look at my photos of basically the Reading Royals. <laughs> um, it's uh, Sam Wismer Photography at 88. Awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. All right. Once again, thanks to Sam Wismer for joining us to talk all things Phantoms. A lot of good stuff in that conversation. Yeah, very a lot of a lot of information, a lot of stuff that's not really out there. Yeah, really cool to get the details on the Flyers AHL affiliate.
that will do it for today's show. Uh, like I said, every day, if you come back tomorrow, we will be talking all things Flyers defense, plus answer your mailbag questions. You can get them to us via Twitter at Lockdown Flyers. You can email us at LockdownFlyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>